think that that's a uh, invocation prayer that he loves to hear. Lord, of all the things we want to confess this morning, it's that we need you. And uh, we appreciate the fact that he uses us, don't we? But, uh, but how much we gather in this place and uh, are so glad to be encouraged by one another because we need the Lord. And when we get together and encourage one another and love on one another, it reminds us of how good and faithful the Lord is to us. And uh, I'm so glad that you're here this morning. I'm so glad that in the midst of all of the things that have happened this week, um, the good, and we, I was talking to... Uh, one family this morning that had a new grandchild born this week, talking to another whose uh, sister is dying, um, talk to another whose wife is having physical difficulties, um, and yet we're gathered here because we know that all that we need is in the Lord's hands, and he is gracious and when we come to him and confess our need, he is so faithful and excited and enthused to grant all that we need in Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's worship that mighty God this morning. Sing his praise that all the world would know that our hope is in the Lord. Amen? I'm going to invite you to begin by singing hymn number 234. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon the throne. Let's stand together and worship him this morning if you can. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly and the crowns of
God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him. attention to our screen at this time. Well, hello, Forsey family. Welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Lonnie, and I'm so glad that you could take this time to be with us. When you came in today, you should have received a bulletin. And in the pew in front of you, there's a little yellow welcome card. We'd love for you to fill that out. On one side, you can leave information just telling us who you are and, and uh, letting us know what you're interested in, and we can get back to you and just take note of your visit and welcome you properly to our church. On the other side, you should find a prayer card where you can just tell us what you'd like us to be praying for you about. And then when the offering plate comes around a little later in the service, we'd like you to just drop that in. Um, as I said, when you came in, you should have received the bulletin, and there's a few things in the bulletin that I'd like to highlight today. First of all, tonight and next Sunday, August 19th and 26th, there's no teens. However, if you'd like to come for an open gym where there's an opportunity for uh, teens to play basketball, that's what we're going to be doing. And so uh, take note of that. August 22nd, this Wednesday, is our last summer orchestra meetup. You know, my daughter and I have been coming to this, and it's just been a great time. You don't have to be a great musician. You just have to be able to read music. And so even if you haven't been to a single one yet, we'd love for you to come out and just join us. We're just working through some songs and playing together and just enjoying each other's fellowship as we worship God through instruments. Um, also, I would like to highlight for you that our baptism class is coming up. Some of you have never been baptized, and yet, you profess to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Well, I want you to know that's something that he commands us to do. He wants us to be baptized. And so if you're interested in that, if there's, you have more questions on uh, September 2nd, there's going to be an orientation class in the church office at 1230. And we'd like you to come to that. And the following Sunday, September 9th, will be the baptism. Also, there's a ministry workshop coming up on September 8th. It's the 3D Gospel. Take a look at this. Go isn't the whole story in missions. Tell adds to it, but that doesn't complete the story either. What if you did go? What if you did tell? And what if it was all in a language your audience didn't understand? That message would fall broken to the ground. Missions is more than just go and tell. It's go and tell a message that can be understood well enough it can be acted upon. Language can certainly get in the way, but worldview is perhaps a bigger obstacle. Worldviews are lenses through which we see and interpret the messages and events around us, and they are often particular to cultures. If you shared the gospel from your worldview with a person from another worldview, would they be able to understand it? Or more importantly, would it resonate in their heart deeply enough that they would act on it? Communicating the gospel effectively starts with understanding the three main worldviews guilt and innocence, honor and shame, fear and power. Think about how the West operates. Individualism and rights are valued. Morality is based on right and wrong as defined by the law. You have the right to your own opinions, your own beliefs, even your own path to happiness, as long as you don't break the law. But if you do, the only solution is to suffer a punishment in proportion to your crime. Most Western cultures are in a constant search for the solution to guilt. Much of the Middle East and Asia operates differently. Family and community are valued above everything else. Personal relationships, reputation, and social status are the primary motivators. Come from a good family, do good things in the community, follow the social norms, and you will have honor. But do something dishonorable or have something dishonorable happen to you, 
and both you and your community will be shamed. As such, these cultures do their best to avoid shame. Some of Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and most tribal areas operate differently still. Reality is built on the spiritual realm just as much as it is on the physical realm. Most of their decisions hinge on the perceived positive or negative reactions from the spirits around them. This results in taboos, superstitions, spells, and sacrifices dominating these cultures. And it results in these cultures living in a constant state of fear. So if you are going and telling, what is good news to each of these worldviews? So the good news, what is good news? Good news varies depending on what cultural background you come from, right? You know, if you're steeped in a culture where you have this keen awareness of demonic powers and you know that you are enslaved to the devil and he's tormenting you, the good news is that there's freedom from that, that Jesus Christ crushed Satan's head on the cross and he rose from the dead and he has power and he invites you to come to him and he fills you with his spirit and you have power over uh, the, the darkness and it's, it's just a, that's good news. If you're coming from a culture that is an honor shame culture where the most important thing to you is to maintain honor, to save face, to have dignity, well then good news is, is once you've learned that you have brought dishonor and shame upon yourself and most importantly that you've brought dishonor to your creator, to God. You, you learn that He has provided a way for you to restore that honor. And He has forgiven you and brought you into a place where He's adopted you as His very own child and let you sit at His right hand and He's given you such a place of honor. And so that's good news. So we love the gospel because no matter what culture you come from, the fullness of the gospel is there and it speaks to you in such a way that really resonates with you. So if you'd like to learn how to share the gospel in a way that resonates with people in these different cultural worldviews, then this ministry workshop is designed to do this just that. If you're a ministry worker here, if you're a ministry leader, you have to come to this. This is something that we're asking you to come to because it's a major part of the vision of our church and Pastor Foster is gonna be leading this. He really wants everybody to be here. Uh, if you're not a ministry worker or a ministry leader, but you're just interested in this idea of how do I share the gospel in different cultures, well, you're welcome to come too. We live in a place where people from all over are in our midst from all of these different cultural worldviews, and we need to learn how to share the gospel in ways that are relevant to them. It's on September 8th from 9 to noon. I'm Pastor Lonnie. Welcome to worship. Well, that's some great information for us this morning. The good news is that one who is, has grace greater than all of our sin has come to rescue, redeem, and free us. Hymn number 201, Marvelous Grace of Our Loving Lord. Let's sing together.
Will you stand for this morning's scripture reading taken from Psalm 103? We're going to start in verse 8 and read through verse 14 together. And let me invite you to just read this together in unison this morning. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, for he knows how we are formed, and he remembers that we are dust. This is the word of the Lord. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Do you hear him today? Will you respond to his tender, faithful compassion for you? So seated. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Please bow with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we pray for that outside. Lord, that whatever emergency may be happening, Lord, that you would be just reminding whoever, Lord, that is, that you are a God who can be called upon. Lord, thank you that you are a God who can be called upon, and we call upon you right now, Lord. Um, Father, this morning as we come to worship, Lord, to hear from your word, God, make us ready to receive your words. May we be soft and able to be shaped by you this morning, Lord, as your word is shared, as you have a message for us. Let us leave different than we came. God, we just ask that you would do a great work among us this morning. Lord, we're going to lift up different needs that we have. Um, We want to lift up our our MOPS ministry and Mothers of Preschoolers. We thank you so much for that ministry and the work that is going on in ministry to uh, 
uh, the, the many moms in our building on Tuesdays. Lord, we want to ask that you would provide for the needs of the program, that you would provide more workers to help watch the, uh, the children during that time, and, and just that you would meet those needs and that this would be a great year of ministry. Lord, we want to continue to pray for Forsy Christian School and the enrollment, and we ask that you would bring more students to our school. And we thank you, Lord, that you know the hearts of each one, uh, each student and family that is here, and we pray that you would be working in them for a great year ahead, Lord. We expect and anticipate great things, and we ask you um, to bless both the school and the MOPS ministries. Lord, we want to also pray for um, those who are all of our students who are going off to college right now. Um, this, this week, next week, Lord, we want to just pray for each of them uh, that are a part of our church that have heard your word and been raised in your word and um, in you and are now going off into a new season of life, I pray that you would remind them of your presence with them, that they would continue to grow in you during this upcoming journey, and that you would bless their parents as they uh, say goodbye of sorts um, and continue uh, uh, to work in lives of families uh, and in the students uh, that are now going into college. Father, we want to lift up a specific prayer request for you for in the ministry in Brazil of Colin Rast and Janet Rast, Lord, we want to ask, God, you know the exact situation, but they need a government document, uh, the title to the building that they are ministering in, and they need that soon, Lord. So we just lift that up to you and ask that you would um, do things quickly, Lord, to make that um, document available so that uh, uh, your work can continue there. Father, we want to pray for um, the Bradley family and uh, Bren Brenda Bradley at the loss of her father, uh, Guy Botts, this week. And Lord, you tell us in your word uh, that you go before and will be with us, uh, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. You tell us not to be afraid and not to be discouraged. We pray for that for the Bradley family right now uh, and the funeral that will be in September. We just ask that you would be near them and comfort them. And Lord, we thank you for the um, successful medical surgeries and procedures of, of late, um, for Malachi Thompson, for Rachel Bufkins, for Mona McCammon, and many others who are now at home resting and recovering. I pray that you would be with them in a special way, um, showing each of them your, your care for them and your will for them in the midst of their recovery. And Lord, we thank you that Wayman Wilkins is at home and resting, and we pray your blessing on him and that he will be able to, to soon, quickly rejoin us here at church. Lord, we just thank you for that you are our good shepherd who loves us and calls us your own when we call upon you in, uh, through Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray all these things in your name. Amen. taking the offering this morning. I'd love to teach you a new song. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. For
Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I love singing that with you. I love being part of that that we that is for C as, as we sing that. Um, I've always long felt connected, uh, of course, here and sort of an extended part of the family, but I've loved the last three weeks of just fully stepping into the we that sings, we love you, Lord, and being part of that chorus. It's been a good three weeks. How are you doing? Doing all right? I've been fed better than ever in the last three weeks. Meals just keep showing up at my door uh, every night. It's been amazing. I got people bringing me coffee right now, which, which we'll get to a little later. Try not to be so distracted by it. But we are just off to, look at this. This is the kind of thing that happens. People just show up with all kinds of stuff, just looking to bless us and welcome us. Thank you, Jonathan. And we do feel blessed, and we do feel welcome. In fact, finally, we, we had a chance to have some people over to actually feed them. And so we did that with this great staff team. I love being a part of this team. I love what God's doing in this team. We talked through this week over lunch one day, Romans chapter 12, and just what does it look like? What has it looked like? What could it look like to be devoted to one another in love, to honor one another? above ourselves, and I love the ways that we're aiming to do that. I love the way that uh, they care about each other, they care about this church, and I love the way this church cares about each other, and uh, cares about, really cares about the church, the whole church. Many of you have had conversations with me, you know, already in the last few weeks about things that you love that God's doing here, things that you long for God to do more of here, ways you long for God to work differently here. And I'm encouraged by it all because all those conversations say that we're invested. You're invested. You care about each other. You care about your church. You care about what God's doing. And you want to see him, you want to see him continue an even greater work in and through, in and through Forcey Bible Church. And I'll tell you, as, as invested as you are and as we are together, infinitely more invested then we are in this church, the Lord Jesus is in, in his church, which includes our church, by the way, right? And so there's things that, just because we're invested, that we, we love and we long for, there are things that he loves about what's happening in his church, and then there's things that he longs for, to be even more so, or, or to be even different. And that's so much of what this series, this Dear Church series has, has been about, is, is about discovering what is Jesus longing for in his church. After all, he's invested, right? He's paid the price for all of us to be a part of this church. So what, what, are, what are his longings? And so we've looked at seven churches that receive letters from Jesus in the book of Revelation. And, and we've kind of worked our way around this circle here, starting in Ephesus, and we're actually coming down to the, to the last one today in Laodicea. And we've seen how each time Jesus speaks in these letters, he has something very personal to say to each church, very specific for them. But he says it loud enough because he wants us to hear it. He wants us to still hear it and apply it 2,000 years later to our lives, to our church. And just before we get trying to figure out all kinds of things around here, like the whole idea is let's make sure we hear what Jesus longs for in his church for all time. And that's what we've gotten to do. We're going to finish it kind of this week with Laodicea, except for next week's going to be even better. You've got to come back next week because what we're going to do next week is we're going to kind of remember all that Jesus has spoken in this, in this whole section of Scripture. And, and, you know, so often we just move from message to message and from series to series without really pausing to, to just allow the Spirit of God to seal what He has spoken into our hearts. And that's what next week's going to be about, just remembering, looking back at some verses, inviting God to seal what he's spoken in our hearts that we would not soon forget it. So that's next week. And then, you know, in September, we're going to kind of continue in the same vein a little bit. We're going to be hearing more from Jesus directly and what he speaks in the Gospel of John, in John chapters 13 to 17 specifically. 
Just like these letters in Revelation, John 13 to 17, are all red letters in some Bibles, because they're all mostly, the, you know, most of them are red letters. They're the words of Jesus. John 13 to 17 are the last words of Jesus to his disciples. And we're going to suggest the last words of Jesus ought to be our first priorities. Before we get rushing ahead to do whatever else, let's again make sure we're hearing the priorities of Jesus. So we'll call that last things first. That's going to start in a couple weeks, and we're, ex- we're excited about it. But today, we get to finish up with Laodicea. And, you know, this is probably the most familiar of the letters in Revelation 2 and 3, but I would also suggest perhaps the most misunderstood of the letters in Revelation 2 and 3. So we need someone to read this letter, just as we've been doing, as if it is just hot off the press. It's traveled around maybe these other cities as they've been delivered, and now it's come all the way to Laodicea, and we get to read it. And who's our reader today? Over here. And why don't you stand? Why don't all you guys stand? And let's just pretend we're the church of Laodicea. We just received a letter from Jesus. We are eager and anxious to read it, and let's read it as if we're reading it for the first time and put ourselves a little bit in their shoes, the letter to Laodicea. The letter from Jesus to us. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold or hot. I wish you were either one or the other, because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold. I am about to vomit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich. I have become wealthy. I have need of nothing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold, refined in the fire, so you can become wealthy and white garments, so that you may be clothed, and the shame of your nakedness might not be revealed, and salves to anoint your eyes, so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him, and he with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you. The word of God. Thank you, Christina, and let's pray. Lord, we just pray that you would again give us ears, not just on our head, but in our hearts, that we may hear with our hearts what you have to say, not just to this church, but Lord, it is your word to us today. Help us to apply it to our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. So like the other letters, it it starts with kind of a description of who Jesus is. These are the words of the amen, it it said. And amen, of course, is that word we use to close our prayers. And did you know that every time you close your prayer, you're speaking a name of Jesus? He's called the amen here. The amen is, you know, we say amen is in so be it or let it be, let it be so or like modern day, kind of like true that, true that, that's true. We believe that, amen. All the promises of God, 2 Corinthians 1.20, are yes and amen in Christ. Because of Jesus, all the promises of God are true for us. So he's the amen. He wants us to know that he's the faithful and true witness. That's the same word we looked at last week to the Church of Philadelphia, that trueness, that faithfulness of Christ. He's the real deal. He's not going away. He's not changing. He's the same. He's as worthy as he is of trusting today, and in the greatest moment of trusting we've ever had, he is still that worthy forever. And then it says he's the beginning of God's creation. Sometimes translated the ruler of God's creation. This word here can mean kind of beginning or ruler. It's kind of beginning in the sense of he is like the, the first 
one or the premier one. So it's kind of related to the idea of, of ruler as in the first, the premier one, you know, over, over everything. And if nothing else, this word that is translated here, beginning or ruler, ought to remind us that this is not the first letter that the Laodiceans had received from the Lord. Because the only other time this word is used as a title for Jesus outside of the book of Revelation is in the other letter in our Bible that the Laodiceans received from the Lord. Anyone have that letter in your Bible? Anyone have the letter to the church of Laodicea? Anyone have the book of Laodiceans in your Bible? Good, I'm glad you're not raising your hands. But you have in your Bible a book that they would have read. You know what one it is? Anybody? Check this out. Colossians. Paul says, after this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans. The letter to Colossae was meant to circulate this whole region. In fact, it says in Colossians, Epaphras is working hard for you. He's the one that would have probably planted the church at Colossae, who receives the letter of Colossians during that time when there's a great church planting movement coming out of Ephesus, where these seven churches, I believe, all ultimately originated from. He's working hard for you and for those at where? Laodicea and Hierapolis. There's this kind of metroplex, you, you could call, these three towns that were all close together. Colossae, just 10 miles east of Laodicea. Hierapolis, just 6 miles north. And what they received is letters they shared with one another. And I assume they would this letter here in, in Revelation as well. And you see, what's emphasized to the letter of Colossians that is evidently still relevant for them is that Jesus is supreme over his church. His, the supremacy of Christ is the theme of Colossians, and that's where that word, the beginning, shows up. Colossians 1, that the Son is the image of the invisible God. In Him all things were created, all things created by Him and for Him. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, there's the word, there's the title the, that we see in Revelation. The beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have the supremacy. The Laodiceans knew this. They had read it 35 or so years earlier when Paul first wrote the letter of Colossians. They knew that Jesus was supreme over them in creation, whatever else they would look to. But you know what? I think they had forgotten it because they would become quite rich with everything else. They had begun to look a lot like their world. And the world around the church of Laodicea was a very wealthy, materialistic world like twice as much as anywhere else. Because not only, like most of the cities we've seen were founded on a major trade route, Laodicea was founded at the junction of two, at the intersection of two major trade routes. They had two theaters in town. And their homes were more than twice as big as most homes in the region. They've excavated this city, and, and they found homes that were... A few thousand square feet. They found man caves in the basement. It was amazing. Like, <laughs> but really big, really big homes. And they were, they were known for it. And they, they prided themselves. They prided themselves. In their wealth. You say, how wealthy are they? Go ahead. I'm dying to ask me. How wealthy are they, Pastor Mike? Go ahead. How wealthy are they? This church was so, this city was so wealthy. Remember how some of the other cities we looked at when they had an earthquake? They got help from Rome and then they built a temple in honor of Rome or they changed their name in honor of the emperor. Remember some of those cities? Well, when a first century earthquake hit this city, they said, no thanks. We've got this. They denied help from Rome, and they even helped others in their area. Very different city than what we've seen. How? Well, they were a banking industry there on those two trade routes. Some very famous people boasted in ancient times that they banked at Laodicea. They also 
were known for their wool. It was a fertile plain area, good for grazing sheep, and there was this black, soft, glossy wool that, that they became famous for, more so than even the, the cities around them, and it was famous for coats even hundreds of years later that were made out of it, and then in addition to that, they had some medicine going on. They were a destination for medical schools, and they had developed kind of an ointment. They became famous for an ointment that was used to treat the eyes, kind of a, an eye salve that was used to treat the eyes. The only thing they didn't have going on for them was water. Everybody else had water, but not them. Being founded at the major trade routes and not so much on natural resources, when they grew bigger, they had to build an aqueduct that carried waters from a few miles to the south in this big three-foot-wide stone pipe up to Laodicea. How yummy do you think that water was by the time it got there? Right? And everyone else around them had better water. Colossae, this is so easy, Colossae C for cold. They were known for their cold, refreshing spring water right there off the river, refreshing. And Hierapolis, here's what's happening in Hierapolis these days. Welcome to Hierapolis. Here's what's happening in Hierapolis this week. People are still going to the ancient city of Hierapolis. That's hot water. Those are hot springs. Hierapolis was known for their hot springs. Back then, even the healing effect that the hot springs had okay, on the people. So you've got this refreshing cold water in Colossae. You've got what's still famous today as a tourist destination. Some of you are wishing you had some vacation time left still to go check that out in Hierapolis. And then you've got poor Laodicea. Lukewarm Laodicea. And isn't Jesus such a good communicator? He tells it just like we need to understand it. That 3D gospel thing, that's so much what it's about. Communicating in a way that is understood by who you're talking to. I know your deeds. You're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other, but you're lukewarm. You're not hot or cold. Lukewarm. Not hot and, 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 and helpful to others like Hierapolis. Not cold and refreshing to others like Colossae. Just blah. And it, it doesn't mean that, you know, they're medium, like somewhere in the middle of hot and cold. Like, the, there's cold as in people who don't even know or care about God at all. And then, you know, medium... And then hot. Sometimes it, this passage is presented that way. That's, that's not what cold means here at all. He's not saying, I'd rather you were just, you know, didn't care about me at all than lukewarm. No. He's saying, you're blah. I wish you were something. You don't need to know Greek to understand this. You don't need to know ancient geography. You just got to know coffee, right? You, you just got to know coffee. I mean, how many of you, now I'm not even a coffee guy, but a lot of you are. How many, this cup is still warm, Ralph. This cup it's a good thing there's cardboard. This is still a warm, I see steam coming out of it. How many of you, if, if I offered it to you and you knew it was safe to drink, would love to drink this hot, steamy cup of coffee right now? Raise your hand. Look at that. Can I get a witness? It smells good. I'm smelling it. And how many of you on a nice, hot day like today, if you had a chance, this is an iced coffee, how many would love to drink an ice cold iced coffee right now? Any takers on the ice? I see a ton of hands out there for the iced coffee, right? And how many of you have got this kind of already drunk a little bit, kind of lukewarm, no steam, no smell? How many would just love to drink this nice lukewarm cup of coffee? Anybody? No hands! <laughs> this is the theology of the church of Laodicea. Not, not only lukewarm, but traveling up that pipe just full of impurity and pollution. It'd be like there were flies in that coffee. Just blah. Just nothing. No, no more wonder in their worship as they gathered together. Just singing songs. No more power in their prayers. Just praying through the motions. No more glory in their gatherings. Like people didn't walk in and see God. 
to God at work, feel God's presence in the gathering of God's people. There wasn't much meaning to their ministry. They couldn't tell many stories about what God was doing. Nothing stood out. There weren't any stories to tell. Not good for much of anything. Not only that, Jesus isn't even there. He's knocking on the door outside the church. Isn't that something? They're all inside having a grand old time, singing about God, talking about God, congratulating each other. And he's like, hey guys, remember me. It's supposed to be about me. Let me back in. You're lukewarm. And he says, I'm about to vomit you out of your mouth. A lot of your translations probably say spit or spew. The thing is, there were perfectly good Greek words to say spit or spew. There was a word, patuo. It even sounds like spit. It's one of those words that means what it sounds like in the Greek language. This is not the word. The, the, the word used is emeo. It's, it's a verb where we get our word emetic from. E-M-E-T-I-C. A word still used today to describe something like a medicine or something that makes you vomit. It's so strong that many commentators and even famous ones that like write study Bibles and stuff, they'll say that this whole church is not saved. Which is interesting because it is a church. He calls them a church. Which you need believers to have a church. But it's a pretty convenient way to get around the passage because if we can just say, oh, they're not even saved, they don't even know the Lord, well, that kind of excuses us from listening to what Jesus says to them, right? I don't think that's what Jesus intended for this passage. I think he's intended us as believers to know loud and clear that we can get kind of lukewarm. That we need to be on guard and nurture our hearts for him. So what is the, what is the problem that makes Jesus just feel, oh, yuck? Well, he says, your first point, by the way, the church is lukewarm. You say, I am rich. I become wealthy. I have need of nothing. They'd begun to think of themselves like the city thought of itself. Rich, wealthy, that's a dangerous place to be. Most of us don't consider ourselves to be very rich or wealthy, but the, the reality is that if we averaged, if we kind of took the average of us and compared it to the rest of the world, we'd fall in about the top 1% of wealthy people in the world, globally. It's just 99% of people in the world don't have man caves or you know, master bedrooms or central air. That's, that's not 99% of the world. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. It's just that Jesus warns us that we better be careful because there's going to be a lot of temptation to get very comfortable in our materialism and to stop trusting in Him. It's a dangerous place to be. And they weren't careful enough. And they said, I become wealthy. I have need of nothing. Do you hear that complacency? They're complacent. This was their attitude toward Rome, right? The city. Oh, we don't need your help, Rome. We've got this taken care of. And good for them. And good for them that they helped others. But you get the sense that spiritually, that these are the kind of people that walked into prayer meetings and everyone shared their prayer requests and it came to them, like, how can we pray for you? And they said, oh, nothing, I'm good. Can't think of anything at the moment. Really? <laughs> And I know, you know, the reason we do that, and I've done that, is just because maybe we don't want to be a burden, or maybe we're just, you know, can't bring ourselves to talk about something, or maybe we just don't feel like it's the right time or place or people. But church, come on. What are we doing after all? Let's be known for people that invite people to pray for us and that pray for others. We, we're trying to get our kids to think this way. Every time they come to church, we... 
we try to ask them after church, who did you either pray for today or ask to pray for you? And I hope some of my kids will be asking you to pray for them. Did you pray for someone today or did you ask someone to pray for you? We talk about not just going to church, but being the church, doing the one another statements of Scripture. Who did you greet today? Who did you welcome into God's presence today? Who did you encourage today? Encourage one another while it is still called a day, Hebrews says. Because look, we could go to the grocery store <laughs> and do a lot of what we do. I mean, I can drive to the grocery store and listen to some good Christian worship music. And I can get my shopping done and make small talk with people along the way at the cashier. And I can drive home and hear a good sermon on the radio. And the things that happen in this place, on this day, ought to make us different from people that just go to the grocery store. Or else why bother? We could go get some shopping done. We get ahead for the week. I don't want to be lukewarm. I can do that anywhere else. When we come into this place, when the body gathers together, we can't afford just to go to church like these guys are doing. We've got to be the church. This isn't welcome to church. Hi. This is we are the church together. Right? I think so. And so just be released to be the church. Okay? Like, let's give ourselves permission to be the church. Let's give ourselves permission when we come in and we see someone sitting by themselves, even if it's outside of our designated section. We were joking about this earlier. Like, let's give ourselves permission to go and to say hi and to welcome them. And not fear, what if they've been here a few weeks already and I haven't met them and they're going to think I'm weird if I haven't met them? And No! Let's just be the church. Let's give ourselves permission when we come to, to pray for each other. Let's not make it feel weird to put our arm around each other and to give prayer or to ask for prayer. When we sing, let's feel free to sing loud, <laughs> to express worship, whatever that looks like. Let's just make sure it's more, more than what we would express at a game or a concert somewhere else. <laughs> Right? Lest we become lukewarm. Let, let's give ourselves permission to confess sin to each other. Let's give ourselves permission to allow the Spirit of God to stir up conviction in us, to come forward at the end of services or to find somebody after service and to get on our knees in a church. Like, get on our knees and ask people to pray for us because we sang it. We need you, Jesus. We can't afford to become lukewarm and have Jesus knocking on the outside. Right? Let's give ourselves permission to talk about the message on the way home and over lunch with our families and throughout the week and to make this a Sunday through Saturday kind of faith. And let's not think that this can't happen to us because that's what they thought. Because the verse goes on in verse 17. You say, you know, you're rich and you don't need a thing. And, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. They were deceived. That's the next point. Oh, they thought they were so rich with their banking, they were poor. They thought they had this great eye ointment, they were blind. They thought they had this great wool clothing, they were naked. They were deceived. And it's so easy to fool others and ourselves with just where, where we're at. I think of so many famous celebrities, even this year, just a couple months ago, some big, famous, rich people. And everyone would say, wow, they have it all together. And next thing you know, they're taking their own lives. And Christians can function the same way. We can just convince everyone else and ourselves that we're okay. And we don't walk around with a little number on our head like 1 through 10 that says how we're really doing spiritually, right? <laughs> that would be helpful sometimes. We would know just who needs to be encouraged, just who needs to be prayed for. But we don't have that happening. But we need to let people know. And you know what? Jesus knows our hearts. We're not fooling Him. They weren't fooling Him. They 
And so he wanted to spit, vomit him out of their mouth. But you know what else? I love this part. Listen to what he says to him. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you could become really wealthy. White garments so that you may be clothed. And the shame of your nakedness might not be revealed. And solved to anoint your eyes so you can see. It sounds like Isaiah chapter 55 when God says, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. Isn't it something that Jesus is still pursuing them? He's still inviting them to receive from him what only he can give. Oh, yeah, he's like, yuck, this is just not what it's supposed to be. But has he given up on them, church? No. He's inviting them to receive real spiritual life from him. He says this, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Lord, your kindness leads us to repentance. That's your fourth thing. This church is loved. Don't, don't believe the lie that somehow God's locked them out for good, that some people commenting on this passage want you to think. Those I love. I'm here. I'm saying this. I'm inviting you still because I love you. I want more for you than what you can imagine, than what you're settling for. I want more because I love you. So, behold, look, you who... <laughs> I stand at the door and knock. Isn't that something? He's not kicking the door down. He's not climbing through a window. He's not going to force himself on us. But he's just going to keep tapping. Keep reminding us. He's still there. He wants more for us. It can happen. It can be ours. If, you want, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. It's more than just eat with him. It, it, it's a cultural experience of just dining for hours with somebody. Really getting to know them. I will come in and dine with him and he with me. And it's not just hearing his voice, because we're all such good hearers of the word, right? But God asks us to do something, to open the door, which means we have to get up out of that comfy chair, <laughs> up out of that chair of comfort and complacency. It's hard to get up, right? None of us like to get up out of that comfy chair. But we got to get up and open the door out of whatever chair it is that's holding us back, our pride, our, our self-reliance and prayerlessness. It's easy to do, to sit there and not, but we got to get up and do it. we got to get up out of... Even the shame that we're stuck in because we just feel, I've gone too far, I could never do this, he's never going to He's never gonna receive me fully back. Oh my goodness, we got to get up out of whatever chair it is, church. The chair of fear that says, I've never done this before, I'm not going to be able to let Jesus in as good as everybody else. we got to get up out of that chair. we got to open that door. we got to do something because he's longing to come in. He's longing to restore himself to us and us to him. And I think he's saying it because there's still people there that want it. They're not too far where they're not hearing the knock. He's talking to people who, who know that worship can no longer just be optional. It has to be vital. People who know deep down that that prayer cannot just be at the right time. It has to be all the time. People who know deep down, even though they're not functioning like it, but people who know deep down that ministry is not just about when it's convenient, when it works with the calendar and the clock and the checkbook, but ministry is about when I am called and what I am called to do and what God commands me to do. He's talking to people who know deep down, even though they're not functioning like it, that confession is not something that they did once and now wait for everybody else to do, but it's something that ought to be a culture in any church in person. He's talking to us. He's talking to us. 
Let us hear what the Spirit of God says to his church and not excuse it away anymore. And so what do we do? I I just want to close with with this. Just some, some practical steps. Jesus is knocking, if you missed that one. Just some practical steps, because I've noticed in spiritual life, there's some, there's some dead zones we can fall into, and they're at certain times, okay? So sometimes we get into a dead zone somewhere between salvation and, and baptism. You know, we, we know the Lord, we're convinced of, of who He is, we've received Him into our lives, but we're hesitating on baptism. Maybe we don't feel good enough, maybe we don't feel ready enough, maybe we're just confused about it. I hope if you're here today and you've trusted the Lord as your Savior, you will explore this idea of baptism. We've got a, a class next week, Pastor Ron, I believe, is teaching, and then a baptism on September 9th. We'd love to have you take that step. When people hesitate at steps that God's calling them to, it's easier to get into lukewarm places. We don't want to be there. Okay? Somewhere between baptism and membership is a dead zone. You know, church membership is something we do here, not... Not because we, you know, need to have a ton of members or because there's some command like you be a church member. No, but there's commands that say be together, commit to one another, do things together. And church membership, I think, from what I understand here, is just a way for people to express that that's what they want to do. You don't get a timeshare for it somewhere. You don't get a special key to the building. You just express that I'm in. I'm all in. I'm all in. That's what Jesus is looking for. Baptism. I'm all in. I'm all under. I'm all in. (laughs) Somewhere between church membership and fellowship, we get stuck. Like maybe you're here and you've, I did the membership thing. I I learned about the church. I did that. That was good. But I'm still not in relationship with people. Take a step toward toward fellowship. I had the greatest time with this mops group this week. Uh, Just the, the greatest time with Mary Ellen Stewart. And she was telling me about this mops, you know, ministry for moms it is like second and fourth tuesdays i think and man if you are a young mom or know a young mom what a great ministry they're going to be out there today with a table you could just let them know you want to be part of it if you can't afford it maybe someone can help i will help i i will if you want to do that or know someone who does i will help make that happen because we need fellowship (laughs) there's a men's retreat coming up we need fellowship there's a there's a dead lukewarm zone in there we don't want to fall into okay and somewhere between, you know, fellowship and membership and ministry. Like sometimes we just get stuck in this place of coming but not as much serving. And it's not necessarily always your fault or our fault. It's sometimes we got to do better at helping people connect. And here's some opportunities to serve. And we don't feel qualified and we don't feel ready. Well, if we just stay in that place, we get lukewarm. I don't want to be that. So serve. The 3D Gospel Workshop. It's just for anyone who wants to get involved in the ministry, even if you're not sure where to serve around here. Jump in. We'll help find a place for you. It's going to be a great day. It's going to be a great day. What I want to do as we close is just, I made some just simple, um, simple sign-up sheets. Basically, baptism, membership, home groups, another thing. I know they're having a home group leaders meeting soon if you want that fellowship. I meant to mention home groups. Maybe you're here and you don't know. I don't know what the first step would be. I'm hearing you. I feel this sense of lukewarm. I don't know what the first step would be for me. Come forward after service and just write your name down or let one of us know. I want to take the first step. Help me find what it is. I mean, for some of you, that would take a huge faith in what the Spirit of God is doing in your heart. Just to take that step and say, yeah, see me. I want to take a first step. I'm not sure what it is. I'm going to put these down here so that after the song, after the service, if you'd like to express some kind of response that... I want to take a step so that I'm less in a position to become lukewarm than I would have been. Let's not just hear the word, right? Let's do the word. Let's open the door. I don't know what it is for you. It could be something entirely different than what I just talked through. Let God speak to you. If you need some help, turn to the person next to you. Help me open the door. Let's pray. Lord, You have spoken so clearly in these letters. So relevant for our lives today. 
Would you finish your work in our hearts this morning? Would you give us the courage, whatever it would look like for us, to get out of whatever chair we're sitting in and to open the door? Would you, by your Spirit, enable us to do that this morning for your glory? And would you make us a hot church or a refreshingly cold one, but one that makes a difference, Lord, because you've made us different. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me this morning. Let's make this our prayer. Heavenly Father, hear the cry of our heart. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, give us a fire that burns for you, that you may be glorified now and for all eternity, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace.